Okay, everything is fine. So today we are going to spend uh, these uh, three hours uh, of lecture uh, by talking about some topics uh, specifically related to security, particular browser security, so client-side security. You uh, learned how to program in JavaScript inside the browser environment, and now today we're going to talk about uh, the risks of doing something wrong in your programming while using JavaScript within the browser, okay? Sh and then we will talk about uh, other two, let's say, I don't want to say minor topics, but uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, topics that are on the side of what we have seen uh, until now. So one is a very specific API inside the browser environment, that is the fetch, that allows us to uh, ask for information via the HTTP protocol to a server, okay? And then a second topic is how to use modules, so program, uh, programs uh, doing, uh, developed by others or by ourselves in other files, in other JavaScript files, and how to import them and use them in your program. Okay, and then in the end we will put everything together and as usual we will uh, develop an example, okay, as much as possible in the room, here in the classroom, and I will provide you with the complete uh, uh, solution just after the lecture. And on, uh, in the next lab that is on Tuesday, next week, you will try to do the same things on your project, on your um, on, on what you are developing uh, uh, using the, the film library and so on, okay? Um, okay, so let's start talking about the first topic, which is browser security, with the uh, subtitle is accidentally executing code in the browser, so some code that you actually, uh, if you think about, you wouldn't want to execute in the browser, okay? So uh, this is just the outline. Very, very simple stuff, but uh, let's talk about, uh, you know, uh, reflect about uh, what we have seen about in the browser, okay? Uh, first of all, uh <coughs> think how the browser operates. The browser loads a document, an HTML document. You already tried to do it in the lab. You loaded it from a file, but you typically load it from a web server, okay? And then the browser interprets the HTML content. So it uh, interprets all the tags, it creates the DOM tree that we have seen last time. <coughs> and sometimes in this uh, DOM tree, you encounter elements or text that says to load additional resources like external files, so CSS files, uh, images, uh, multimedia content and so on, and also JavaScript code, okay? So other JavaScript code. And everything is processed by b the browser uh, until everything is, uh, uh, you know, is uh, terminated. So everything has been interpreted and all the resources have been loaded and interpreted uh, themselves, okay? Um, of course, we have seen last time that code uh, is, uh, I would say, the, the, the riskiest part of this process because the code can modify the content of the page, right? We, we have seen that we have APIs in the browser uh, by which we can, uh, do modifications in the DOM tree and as a consequence in what uh, the browser shows in the window, right? So uh, we can manipulate the appearance of the content of the window, okay? Um, so in short, we are executing the code that comes from the server. So the code that has been written by somebody else. Actually, uh, you access a server, right? and you didn't write the code that is uh, stored on the server in the form of JavaScript file. Somebody else has written that code. So that's why you would like to access only trusted websites, right? You, you, you should trust these websites because actually it's code that uh, will be executed inside the browser in your local environment, okay? We already say that uh, the browser takes a lot of precautions, uh, so it's very careful in executing this code. It doesn't allow the code to do many risky things like accessing the local file system or doing other, um, other things that, uh, that are typically very risky. Okay, but uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, the code uh, can still do some, some, some risky operation, uh, like stealing, typically the, the risky operation is stealing sensitive information and sending it to some attacker somewhere in the network, okay? Because we, 
uh, in JavaScript, uh, we will have uh, a, an API that allows to contact other web servers, okay? And this can be executed by, by JavaScript code, simply by JavaScript code, okay? And uh, if this JavaScript code is able to take information or steal information from wherever the browser environment allows, it can take this information and send it somewhere in the network, okay? Um, so this is the so-called cross-site scripting, and we will talk a lot about this uh, today. So what is, in practice, cross-site scripting? Well, actually, it's a very generic term. It started as a very specific uh, issue, okay, just uh, uh, quite a number of years ago. But uh, nowadays, this cross-site scripting, with, by the way, is uh, uh, abbreviated as XSS. So X means cross, okay? Uh, just type of in uh, injections where, in short, uh, malicious scripts or malicious programs uh, um, that are inserted in a place where you trust the content, like uh, in a trusted website for a trusted web application, and you don't expect that this web application serves you, uh, you know, uh, programs or content uh, that contains malicious actions, okay? Like you are accessing uh, google.com or whatever, facebook.com or uh, polito.it and so on, and you don't expect that this code is malicious, right? Okay? Uh, and uh, indeed, the browser has no way to know if the code that is uh, going to be executed is malicious or not. It's up to you. You decided to access polito.it because you think the reputation of, web of the website is good and uh, you're interested in information stored in that, uh, in that website and so you go and access the content, okay? But the browser, anyway, execute this JavaScript code. We already seen the, the code that is executed just because we would like to have uh, nice uh, buttons or other elements in the user interface, like, you know, with Bootstrap. With Bootstrap, you import a CSS, but you also import uh, a JavaScript file that uh, uh, defines some code, you know, to create the, the most, uh, let's say, advanced behavior in the, in the interface, okay? Uh, and uh, so we must be really, really careful about which kind of code and which code, actually, we would like to allow the browser to execute, okay? Uh, because this code can, be, can do anything, like including DOM manipulation. That means uh, making things appear different from what they are and so on, okay? You can create a form asking for your credit card number or whatever, you know, password, etc. Even though in the original uh, website uh, the, there's nothing like this, okay? That just because you loaded a, a JavaScript file and you, you don't know that the browser has loaded this malicious JavaScript file, that creates elements okay, and that are integrated with the rest of the interface and looks like, uh, you know, the, the, the original ones of the original web application and you are tricked into entering information, or, uh, for instance, that, that you're not supposed to, to give, okay? Uh, or, as we said before, simply the JavaScript explores the browser environment and looks for information to steal, okay? That depends on the attack. So we can classify this uh, um, um, cross-site scripting behavior in, in two different ways. We will explore now this uh, type of attacks. Um, one classification is based on how these attacks work. Okay, so there are basically three types of attacks. And another way of classifying these uh, behaviors is where they happen. Do they work on the server side? Do they work on the client side? Okay, mostly on the client side, but something that can happen on the server side as well. Okay, uh, there are always links on these slides. Uh, uh, there is this uh, website, uh, o Wasp. Uh, no, there's no slide about this. There should be. Uh, let me go at the end. Um, uh, just, uh, um, you know, uh, no, oops. Well, I hope I didn't drop a slide about OWASP. Anyway, um, you can always click on these links, uh, okay? Uh, let's try. And that this very uh, nice and also well, well done and well maintained uh, website, which is, uh, uh, whose URL is owasp.org. 
okay? Or maybe I already mentioned uh, it in, in other slides, right? So uh, that is uh, uh, the, uh, a reference, you know, for good practice and good implementation in web applications that takes into account uh, a lot of security aspects. And if you stick to these guidelines, uh, you are, um, I mean, you are supposed to be quite safe, okay, in terms of what, what uh, the, the safety of your application, so what the attackers uh, should be prevented from doing, okay? Um, so when you want to go into more details about something, you just click on these links in the slides, okay? So you want to m have more information about uh, cross-site scripting, you just have the link here. Okay, so let's have a look at, uh, at three very common types of uh, cross-site scripting attacks. Uh, so this is the first one, the reflected attack, cross-site scripting attack. So in short, there's an attacker, there's somebody, some malicious actors, actor in the network, that uh, send a string to a victim, typically a link, you know, the links that you receive in emails, in which they say, well, please click here, there's a problem with your account, there's a problem with uh, whatever, okay? They try to uh, induce you to click on this uh, link, okay? Which, in short, opens a browser locally in your computer or your smartphone, and the browser makes a request for the web server with this uh, link, okay? Um, why I say a link and not just a string? Because with the string, I mean, you do nothing. With the link, typically, the behavior is open a web browser, give the link to the browser, and go and ask for the resource to the web server. So you have something that happens in the network, right? So once you open this link, it sends the request to a web server. The server reflects uh, the results back uh, in the response, and typically this link contains uh, something dangerous, okay? Some code, typically. Maybe in, a, in an obfuscated way, so you cannot really read it from the link, because they use the, some certain uh, URL encoding or whatever that prevents you from immediately see that this, this is a malicious link, okay? You know, links nowadays contain a lot of random characters, so everybody think it's normal to have these random characters in, in links, okay? Uh, because they, they contain, uh, you know, legit legitimate information from most of the times, but, you know, you can hi hide information in, in those links as well. Uh, and so uh, a, 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 a server that contains a program that uh, has some bugs in terms of security reflects uh, uh, part of the information which is sent with the link to the server, it reflects it back to the user in the browser. Like, for instance, uh, the typical places where this can happen is search results, error messages, and so on. So places which are not, you know, the typical places of the default application just opened uh, from, from scratch, okay? And the browser, uh, for some reasons, executes the malicious code which could be HTML code containing text that says to execute a certain JavaScript program in another place and so on, or directly JavaScript code, or something malicious directly in HTML and so on. Uh, and the browser executes the, the code because it comes from the trusted web server. So it has no reason to think this is not legitimate because it's in the response of the web server, okay? It's not just in the link, it's in the, in the response, okay? And so this code, of course, does something malicious, and what we will see typically here is always, you know, send some uh, sensitive information to, to the attacker, okay? And um, why, uh, why sending sensitive information is a problem? Because sometimes sensitive information means that you can uh, perform actions uh, where, um, you know, uh, that are supposed to be only from authenticated users or users that have some specific rights to do things uh, in certain uh, websites or on, on certain resources, okay? So in short, it, it, it can steal a, a session cookie for a session which is active, like, uh, you know, the, uh, the, 
the, the, the session active with your bank account because uh, for um, by chance you you had uh, you know the your your uh, the website of your bank opened uh, in the same browser and so on. Just uh, an example, but it can order something on uh, e-commerce website or whatever uh, it can do. Okay. Um, okay. So that's the the schema of wh what is happening in this kind of attack. And this cross-site scripting uh, um, attack is not persistent in the sense that uh, the content uh, is stored in the link. And so if you want to uh, do it again, you must induce the user to click again on the link. Okay? Because uh, the malicious uh, payload is just stored uh, in the string, so in the link that needs to be clicked. Uh, let's see an example. Because I know it's a bit difficult to imagine these kind of things. But think about uh, a null like this. This is just an example. I'm not saying that uh, they always work and so on. Okay? But let's say you have an application that allows you to search for something. It's quite normal. I mean, you have an application which has a database on the, on in, in the backend part, and uh, there are a lot of data, and you want to search for something. So there's an API on the application, so the specific URL that allows you to pass a parameter with a string to search. Let's say search for a certain page that contains something, and let's say that we would like to search for this string. Uh, less than script and so on, so you see a tag with uh, some code, j uh, JavaScript code in the, in the middle, uh, and uh, fine, okay. That's, that's a, a search. Uh, I mean, a search that we could do. I mean, mm, the problem is not doing the search. The problem is, is how, uh, what the server response looks like, okay? So the server response will not find something like this, and it's configured to say, to provide you just a default page that says, uh, uh, this thing that you searched uh, 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 is, uh, cannot be found, okay? But unfortunately, it doesn't check what is sending back uh, in terms of what you are searching. It's not a just a generic page not found. It's a page that says, uh, well, the page uh, that is named like the one that you asked for cannot be found, okay? And if you put uh, some HTML code here, this is just HTML with inside some JavaScript code, if you reflect it back from the web server as it is, this will be executed on the client side because the browser has no way to know that this comes uh, from the request that you made, okay? It's just content coming from the web server, okay? And of course, here we will just play with alert. Alert is uh, an API of any browser that displays a window with some message, okay? Just to show you if it works or not. But instead, it could be loading another JavaScript file or executing some code like, uh, you know, uh, uh, doing a, a, an HTTP request on a third-party web server, typically the attacker's web server, uh, sending some private information that you're not supposed to, to send to this attacker, okay? So that's the principle, okay? And what's the problem here? I, uh, the problem is that the server should check what is reflecting back from the input, um, taken from the input uh, for, from the request that the user has sent to, to the web server. So, um, in short, uh, everything that comes from, from the client side, so from the user, should be checked to see if it is safe or not, okay? And it should be in some ways uh, 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 sanitized, so checked for, every, for anything dangerous, and uh, some, uh, the, the things that are dangerous should be removed, and then it can be sent back to the, to the client, okay? We will see how to do this uh, uh, in a few minutes. Let's see a second uh, type of attack, stored uh, cross-site scripting attack. It's very similar to the previous one, but uh, the fact is that uh, the operations, uh, the same operations happens in two steps at two different times. So, so first, the attacker in some ways interacts with, with your website. I mean, the, the website under attack, not, doesn't really 
import, it's not really important if it's yours or not. But I mean, the website under attack, the, the, the attacker sends something which gets stores stored in, in, in the storage, in the database, okay? Like uh, it, it writes a post on, a, on, a, on an application where you can, you know, uh, put posts uh, and uh, post uh, content in general, okay? Rich kind of content, like, uh, let's say, like the Stack Overflow, you can show code, you can show text, uh, HTML text, and so on. And uh, this gets stored because it's a, it's a post like any other post by any other user, no problem. And until now, we are safe, okay? But then another user comes and visits uh, the website and looks for something, and it finds the what has been posted by the attacker, okay? And again, if the website is not very careful about what has been posted, you risk again that you send back to the user something that is interpreted as HTML and JavaScript code on the browser side, and so you risk executing code from a third party, so the attacker, that has been stored previously when the attacker interacted with the web server and stored the the information in the database. So, uh, in the previous slide, the, the information was directly in the payload of the URL, so like the search string. Here, it, it has been stored previously by the attacker in the database, okay? So, this, is, uh, this attack is persistent in the sense that what has been stored in the database is there in the database, and every time you ask for that page, this content comes out, and the attacker has to do nothing, okay? Uh, it's already stored, just it, it needs to store it once, okay? And of course the code will do the exact same thing, okay? Uh, okay. Um, okay, so let's see an example. The attacker saved this content in an article in a forum, okay? Like the Stack Overflow. Oh, our, uh, you know, question and answer website that we'll see later today uh, in, during the lecture. So, let's say it stores something like uh, uh, give an answer about, uh, you know, what you should do for, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, prevent uh, security attacks on websites, okay? So, it writes a bit of HTML code. Of course, this should be allowed by the website, but many websites allows you to use a, a minimal set of HTML tags just to format the content a little bit, otherwise it's just text, okay? So, so text like H1, the paragraph, the bold, the italics, and so on, are typically allowed. The problem is that if you allow also, you know, dangerous tags like script again, I, I use script because it's very immediate to understand, you know, script introduce uh, JavaScript content, so executable code, so. That's very easy to understand, but there are more subtle stuff that you can insert, and we will see it in the example later today. You know, you have this script alert something, but here you should think in terms of dangerous uh, script, uh, dangerous uh, programs, like, uh, you know, taking information from your DOM or from the uh, local storage of the browser, like cookies and stuff, and send it over the network to certain URLs. And so the server sends uh, the HTML code to any user that requests the article. So it just formats it uh, in a suitable way, maybe in a list of answers, and one of the answers is just the answer of the attacker, okay? So basically this code gets executed because it's simply served by, again, a web server which is trusted by the browser, okay? These are just uh, risks that we can encounter, okay? If we don't program the server side very carefully, okay? So this, uh, these two are basically server side problems, okay? They can be intercepted on the client side as well, okay? With some JavaScript code, but uh, typically they are server side problems. Let's have a look at uh, an attack which is more uh, client based, <laughs> okay? So which is the so called DOM based cross site scripting attack, okay? So here, what happens? Um, uh, a malicious string is sent to the victim, so again, a link is sent to the victim, as in the previous case, 
in the first case. They use a clicks, uh, okay? And so uh, the link becomes active in the browser and uh, uh, the application that has already been loaded by the browser, okay? Or that will be loaded by the browser by accessing uh, the, the website through the link. Uh, the application itself contains unsafe actions, unsafe JavaScript actions that modifies the browser DOM, which are needed to make the application work. So typically they work well, okay? But, but using a, a, a URL that maybe causes problem because, uh, you know, uh, the application has been written in a way to rely on the URL to do some actions, make the application modify the browser DOM, so the content of the page. And this DOM, in short, uh, triggered the execution of the malicious code, okay? And the code again steals the information and so on, okay? Let's have a look uh, at, at the code because otherwise it's uh, quite difficult to understand, okay? Um, so, let's say that in your application, you already, you know, uh, uh, um, um, for, the, for the previous two cases, you already handled them correctly, but you're still doing something like this. Uh, you are taking a part of the URL, of the current URL, so the hash part, which is typically the part of the URL, which is uh, after the hash sign, okay? The hash sign is a way to index a, 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 play, a specific place inside an HTML document, okay? It's in, this, in the standard format of URLs, okay? And so this hash, okay, can be accessed, and maybe your application is using this part of the URL to show you something, uh, to, to store some uh, status and so on. And uh, of course it's doing something uh, that uh, we, would define, we would define as uh, quite dangerous, okay? So take this part of the URL and write it to, into the DOM. So in short, uh, using it as a part of the HTML to be um, uh, inserted in the DOM tree, okay? Because the the application works in this way because you decided that this was a nice way to program your application, okay? Because in, in the hash, maybe you, you, you put, uh, I don't know, the, the current position we, uh, where you are in a document, uh, and so you would like to show this uh, position in a, I don't know, in a canvas, in a, in a place uh, on the side of the page and so on. So it's a completely legitimate way of uh, thinking how the application should work. But what we didn't think is that uh, we are not the only ones who decide which URL should be used by the application. The URL can come also from outside the application, okay? Like in the form of the U URL that you clicked uh, uh, before, that the, 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 the victim clicked uh, before, okay? And so this uh, part after the hash, which is typically created and defined by the application, now comes from an external URL, okay? Coming from an email or whatever. And this gets interpreted as the URLs that are created by the application itself, okay? And this this code is, is uh, has a problem, of course, because it takes uh, this uh, part of the URL and it doesn't check if it's safe or not, because it wrongly assumes that it, it is safe because it was created by the application, which is true until you stay in the application. But if you get the URL from an external uh, a source, like an email and so on, this is true, not true anymore, okay? And so, in short, uh, the problem is that uh, uh, you have uh, a place, a source, uh, that can be controlled by an attacker, typically the URL. That's the uh, easiest thing because they send you links, okay? And, uh, and so there's uh, the corresponding resource in the DOM, which is window location that contains uh, this URL. 
and you use some unsafe programming in your application using part of this information that can also come from outside to decide the appearance of your application. So in, in short, you use the uh, property inner HTML or eval or document write and so on. And there are quite a list of common sinks. They call it sinks because, you know, the information from the attacker goes down there in the sink and it gets executed or interpreted by this sink. Okay. Uh, you can click and I invite you to click on this link. Okay. Uh, sinks. Uh, uh, okay. There are common sources here. Okay, so typically the URL in the various form, okay, full URL or a part of the URL and so on, or other places like uh, also the local storage and stuff like that. So mm, local information stored by somebody else in the browser. And these are the uh, dangerous uh, things, okay. Um, so, yeah, uh, a document write that is a way to create a new part of a DOM and so on, okay? Uh, yes, okay. Uh, so this is just a link that I put in the slide, okay? And in short, the browser executes uh, this code, which is typically working normally. So that's a normal way of, uh, of working for your application. But in this case, it takes unsafe input and it creates a problem in the application, okay? Um, so this, uh, I would say, the, the, the three main types of uh, uh, cross sc scripting attacks, okay? So reflected, the browser sends, sends back some information that should have been sanitized or the attacker is able to store this information on the server, and so typically the server once uh, stores the information and doesn't check every time if it's safe or not to send it back. Or there are some interaction between uh, uh, the, uh, what the, uh, what the um, attacker does and the code of, the, uh, of your application so that uh, what is sent by the attacker gets interpreted by your application in an unsafe way. And typically we've seen uh, the, you know, a part of the URL. That's uh, the very, the most common example. Okay. Um, okay. Before going uh, into the topic on how to prevent all this stuff. Okay. Uh, we would like to have a look at these cross-site scripting issues uh, still from a different perspective. So first of all, they are not uh, completely independent, okay? There can be stored uh, cross-site scripting as well as reflected cross-site scripting and so on. But also it is useful to think uh, about cross-site scripting in terms of where it can happen, either the server or the client, okay? The server uh, means that uh, in some ways, the problem comes from the server, okay? So it's the server that is serving dangerous content to the client. And the client just executes the content because it, it thinks it is safe, okay? While with the client cross-site scripting, some untrusted data is used on the client side without the server interaction to update information in the client, so to manipulate the DOM, and so everything happens on the client side. The last example was just on the client side. So in short, the website, I mean, it, it's contacted, uh, it serves some content, but the problem is not the content that is served from the website. The problem happens entirely on the client side. You see these three and four steps uh, happens on the client side. The website just uh, ignores uh, the hash part, so the remaining part of the URL. Just ignores it. It serves, uh, you know, the same content and the same application. The problem is that the application has a bug, an internal bug, that, but the bug is executed on the client side. Okay. So that's a difference between the two, and maybe it could be uh, more, uh, say, uh, uh, easier to understand if you think in these terms. 
Okay? So let's come to what we can do. So mitigation strategies. What should we do to prevent these behaviors? Okay? First of all, only use safe JavaScript methods and functions. Okay? And which are the safe uh, methods and functions? See guidelines. Again, click, uh, and there are quite a lot of stuff to read, okay? I mean, uh, we will uh, um, uh, give you a rough idea, okay, on uh, what is safe, what is not. If you are not sure, just check before using, you know, something which y you never used before, okay? So, uh, first of all, uh, uh, you need to handle untrusted data, so data that comes uh, not from your application, but from some external uh, source that can be input from the user or URLs, as we saw before, okay? Clicked uh, from another application. You should treat uh, this untrusted data only as text, okay? So force the application to treat this data only as text. So not as code. And that's a very simple way of preventing the malicious code to be executed. Okay? Without code, you know, there's nothing you can, you can do as an attacker. Okay? And so in short, a very simple way to um, uh, handle uh, data as text, uh, uh, if you want to display it, okay, is just convert uh, uh, the very sensitive characters for HTML, which are in short these uh, six ones, to HTML entities using what the so-called escaping. That's an equivalent way to express the same content for displaying purposes that uh, makes them, uh, um, um, uh, makes the browser ignore them when they parse the content. But they show exactly the same, okay? So this, uh, and LT uh, semicolon appears as a less than sign when you show it in the browser. But it's not interpreted as the start of the tag, okay? So this is uh, what is called escaping, okay? Uh, and so basically this prevents uh, a lot of uh, problems because uh, in short, you can show tags uh, just for the user to see those tags, but you are not uh, interpreting them as tags. And this solves quite a lot of problems. But this only works if you are inserting tags uh, for the purpose of showing them, okay? Like in a post, a blog post, you want to show how to program in HTML. Of course, you just want to show, not the browser. Uh, you don't want the browser to execute this code. So this is fine in this case, okay? But if I would like to add uh, 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 content in the DOM, okay? And this content comes uh, from uh, uh, these untrusted sources. What should I do? Well, first of all, don't use those dangerous things, so the inner HTML, document write, etc. Just use DOM methods to create uh, dynamic uh, DOM elements, as we saw in the, and you did in the last lab, okay? Uh, add element, create element, uh, append child, and so on. Okay, okay. So of course you don't create a script one, <laughs> but the rest is safe. Okay, and you don't use dangerous uh, methods. So no inner HTML, document write, no evaluation. So in short, execution of strings of content that comes from uh, uh, um, untrusted sources. Okay, so that's the first step. Try to distinguish between safe sources, so data that comes from uh, the in, uh, your application, which is already stored in the database and so on, or it's a constant string which is defined by you in the code of your application, and dynamic data that can come from uh, external sources, because that's, that is uh, um, uh, untrusted by definition. That's a question, right? Yes, so the, the escaping works like this. You give a string, uh, th that's a, uh, yeah, that's a slide after, okay. So you have a string that you would like to escape, 
okay? And so in short, you uh, substitute uh, uh, dangerous characters with safe ones. But this is just for display. So in short, you find a, a less than sign, a less than character, and this is substituted by the equivalent sequence which has the same appearance but no effect when you parse the HTML, okay? So when the browser parses the HTML. And this can be done automatically. So we can move to this slide. So there are uh, uh, JavaScript libraries that can do this for you because of course it's a bit tedious to do and also error prone uh, uh, as usual in, in, in security. So in short, there are these, uh, typically these uh, six characters which are escaped, it means uh, transformed in a form uh, like this with the end at the start and so on that are fine for display, so they display in, exact, uh, in the exact same way but they are not parsed by the browser, okay? And you don't need to know the, you know, the translation for each character, and this library can do it for you. Okay, like uh, for instance, the slash, it's not, the, there's no sequence uh, like GT, less than, uh, LT, and so on. Uh, you can use the uh, hexadecimal value and so on, but this is already embedded in these libraries. And of course, this is uh, standard HTML. We are not inventing anything. I mean, uh, HTML since the beginning allows you to specify the content to be displayed in this form, okay? So this library is just using the safe way of displaying those characters instead of the default way, which is, you know, the, um, writing the character directly. But those characters can, can be interpreted and these sequences are not interpreted as HTML code, okay? And actually, so, there's the escape function that does exactly this work in the validator package in, uh, uh, that you can um, uh, use uh, uh, in, uh, in Node.js, for instance. So you just install this package and use it. Uh, or if you are programming in, the, uh, um, in your web server with Express and you're using the Express validator, that's a very convenient way uh, of uh, doing the escaping on the parameters coming from the client, which are actually the dangerous uh, thing that you have on the web server. And you just use dot escape on the result of check. The result of check is an object that provides you a, a, a set of methods and that's the escape method that allows you to say, I want to th this content to be escaped. So it will be made available in the form of uh, uh, here, for instance, body dot explanation, but it will be already transformed in this way. So you don't have to take this string, import uh, the validator and do validator escape. It can be done directly here, okay? So it's been in, in integrated in the Express validator. That's the question. Yeah. Is there any way for an adopter to understand if we are using escape or not? Uh, yeah, probably yes for the attacker. That's a way to understand if we are using escaping or not. So just submit, uh, like a, a, in a post, for instance, you, you submit a string, so less than string greater than, and you see what comes back as the result. Uh, you open the inspector of the, browse, of the browser. So you have a look at here, okay? And here, if you don't see the less than sign, but you see and something that means the server is uh, correctly escaping content, okay? Uh, otherwise, I if you get uh, the same thing that you put in as input, probably the server is not escaping things and so probably the attacker understand this is a vulnerability and maybe exploits this, uh, uh, this, uh, this issue, okay? So thank you for the question, actually. It's very interesting because, of course, the attacker has no access to this code. It doesn't know what you are doing on the server side. And this is code running on the server side, which is, cannot be seen uh, by the attacker. While the code that runs on the client side can be seen by the attacker. So your, your client code of your web application can be seen by anybody. It's here. Uh, you see? Uh, this is uh, OWASP website. Of course, there will be stuff. Uh, I don't know wh wh what they used, but uh, you know, 
this is just uh, the, the JavaScript code running on the client side. You access uh, the whole JavaScript code because uh, you need to download it and run it locally because that's the principle of using you know, JavaScript code on the client side. Okay? Um, fine. Um, okay, so escaping is one option, but sometimes uh, we actually don't want to remove the tags. Actually, we would like to keep the tags. For instance, uh, uh, you are designing a visual HTML editor. So on, on one side, you program and you write your HTML code. On the other side, you would like to, sh to, to see the output. And to see the output, the HTML code has to be interpreted. It cannot be just, cannot just be shown as it is. The browser needs to interpret this, uh, this HTML. Or maybe, as I was saying before, you would like to allow the user to use some, uh, you know, HTML formatting options. Typically, in a in a in a blog post, you would like to allow the I don't know the title, the bold character, the maybe changing the, the font size and this kind of basic stuff, okay? This text should be kept and not escaped, otherwise that will not be interpreted by the browser, okay? And so the problem is uh, how can we keep uh, the safe text uh, and the safe stuff and discard the dangerous stuff? Well, this is very difficult. That means that uh, the input, so the content needs to be sanitized before it is given for, to the browser for parsing, for interpreting, okay? And luckily, there's a very good library that uh, does this operation, which is called DOM Purify, uh, which uh, tries to remove all potentially dangerous content uh, before it is processed uh, by the browser. If you use it on the content, okay? So it's a library that you need to import and use it on the content, on the risky content, before giving the content to the browser, okay? You can use it either, uh, I mean, both on the server and on the client side, okay? It works in both places. Uh, if you click again, you'll see the, the website and you'll see instructions how to use it both on the client part and also on the server part. Okay, but we will do it today, later when we deal with the example, okay? So there's also an example here, how to use it on the server side. That's actually the place which is mostly useful to us because typically we will sanitize stuff on the server before storing it in the database or at least before returning it to the browser, okay? Uh, we can also sanitize stuff on the client side, but it's a more uh, specific uh, uh, behavior because you need to have something that runs on the client side only. Like, as I was saying before, you write on one side of the window and you want, would like to have the output on the other side without interacting with the server. This is more, a, a more peculiar uh, web application, okay? But typically we interact with the server, so our problem is to sanitize stuff as we see the stuff passes uh, through our code, our server code, okay? Uh, there are instructions on the, on the previous website that I showed you. It's a bit uh, difficult to use uh, in the sense that you need to import two packages, not just one on the server side, etc. Because this library was born to be run on, on the client side. So it basically needs uh, a, a, a sort of uh, client JavaScript environment to run correctly. And that's why we need this second package to create a, a sort of client side uh, environment where we can initialize the, li the library and then use it, okay? And so in short, how it works? Well, it knows what is dangerous and what is not because the designers of this library have and add a lot of experience on these things, okay? And so it leaves uh, 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 text which don't create problems as they are, like B means bold, I means italics, uh, and uh, maybe the other text I don't remember now, like H1, H2, and this kind of stuff, which is uh, fine. But it knows that some text or some attributes of some text can be dangerous. 
That's the example that uh, we will use in our tests, okay? Which is a bit uh, different from the previous one. The previous one was quite obvious. If you put, uh, if you put um, a script, of course, script has to be removed. That's code. We don't want to allow code. That's very easy. But it is uh, more subtle stuff. Like that's an image. It seems normal, okay? There's a source, so it means that's a URL where you would like to get the image. But if you get an error while loading the content, while loading the image, just execute this code, okay? And that's this uh, very, uh, uh, let's say, mm, strange, uh, we can say strange attribute of some text uh, where you can define uh, some code to be executed executed when there is an error in rendering the, um, the element, the tag in this case. So of course there will be an error because there's no image at this URL. And so this code on error something will be executed, okay? So this seems uh, innocuous, so no, no consequences. But actually it is not, okay? But the library knows which attributes are dangerous and which uh, are not. Typically, all attributes that can include uh, code are removed. Okay, very simple stuff like on click, uh, etc. But I mean, on click, we need to wait for the click from the user. So it's not really an attack until somebody clicks. With on error, on error is automatically executed because we have uh, a, a URL for the image which is not valid. So the browser will automatically execute the on error when it loads the image and it tries to load the content of the image. Okay? And of course the library will strip, so remove all the content which is not safe. So all attributes which are not safe. Okay? While keeping the rest because maybe the image is still valid and there's no reason why you should remove image. At least for users that uh, are not malicious, they don't put on error. They just would like to put an image because, I don't know, they, they would like to add this image to their post, okay? So that's an option, a good option actually, the best option that we found until now. Of course, uh, uh, I mean, keep in mind that this library should be updated periodically because they are libraries that tries to you know, incorporate uh, the, the knowledge of the community about possible attacks, and attacks typically evolve, and defense evolves as well, okay? So it's not like you, today you, you download the DOM Purify, and in five years it will still work perfectly. Yeah, for, for, for what is the past attacks, typically yes, but maybe somebody else will come out with some new attacks that needs to be incorporated in the DOM Purify library, so prevented by the DOM Purify library because they work in a slightly different way, or maybe they introduce a new attribute or whatever that was not supposed to work in a certain way, they discover it and they update the library, okay? So, you know, security, as they say, it's more a process than just, you know, something you designed from the beginning and it's valid until, you know, your, your application leaves, okay? So you should uh, constantly update uh, your libraries and your security measures uh, and so on because uh, new attacks will be developed uh, and new countermeasures will be developed as well, okay? Um, so... No, keep in mind the difference between the two. Escaping means uh, I would like to show what is expressed in this uh, uh, variable, in this um, um, content, okay? So I don't want to change the appearance. The appearance should be the same. That's escaping, okay? We just uh, uh, make sure that the browser doesn't interpret the content as code. Okay, but the experience is exactly the same. Sanitization instead removes a part of the content because we cannot, uh, um, we, we just are not just interested on the appearance, but we would like to execute the content, okay? And so everything which is not safe has to be removed. Like the script tag here, for instance, which is quite obvious, okay? Of course, the appearance uh, will change 
but we cannot do anything about this. But this typically happens only with the attacker. So we are not interested in the appearance of the website for the attacker. We are interested in being safe. Okay? While before, we are interested in, in showing exactly the same content, but in a safe way. Okay? Uh, as I said, uh, this escape is also uh, available in Express Validator, so very useful for us. Okay. So in short, in short, trying to summarize what we discussed, uh, well, you should always think in terms of where the content should be shown and displayed um, in your web application, okay? So uh, if the content is coming from the server, well, you should make sure that the server has prepared the content in a way that is not harmful to the client, okay? So, like, uh, you know where the content will be used because you designed both the server and the client, so you know how the client part of the application works, and so uh, you know that you would like to use it uh, uh, as HTML code. So, fine, but you must sanitize it, okay? Or you would like to show it uh, just uh, uh, because you would like uh, that the appearance is uh, exactly the one as the, as, the, as the code, and so you need to escape it, okay? So you need to think in terms of where the content will be used to decide what to do on the server side to make the content safe for the client. So this is the so-called uh, context-sensitive server-side output encoding. So the server prepares the content to be sent to the client depending on where the content will be used. Will it be used uh, in the HTML content, so rendered as HTML? You decide to either escape it or make it uh, safe, sanitize it, okay? You need to be careful about attributes, okay? Typically, they are not safe if they can execute code, so they just need to be removed. Even CSS is dangerous. Many things are dangerous. So, um, no, uh, you can set, uh, you know, so you can create and set uh, properties of CSS with uh, content that comes from unsafe places, but you cannot set anything else, okay? Uh, I'm not really an expert on CSS. Here, we need to rely a little bit on, you know, the community, the security community, and what is safe and what is not. Also because it's very difficult, you know, to, to know how every attack works and uh, uh, which are the countermeasures that should be used for every, every type of attack, okay? So in short, if they say only set property values, just stick to this uh, statement and don't create CSS dynamically using something different, uh, just setting, uh, you know, um, uh, properties on CSS. So don't, don't take CSS or strings that comes from the from from uh, from outside, from unsafe places, potentially from an attacker, and use it as CSS strings completely. Because maybe they can hide the stuff in the page and so on. Okay, and so uh, they can trick you in doing something that you're not supposed to do in your application. Okay, that's the principle. Uh, but there are also other examples where, in general, you should not allow JavaScript code coming from, uh, uh, you know, unsafe sources. This is pretty basic, okay? But, um, you know, you should just use it as strings, okay? If you, you can show them, because maybe in a, in a programming uh, blog, you would like to show some JavaScript code, but you must make sure that you escaped everything and you show the code as string, not something that can be executed, okay? And we also saw the URL context, for instance. You, you, you remember the, the one that we, used the, that we showed in the beginning, like searching and so on. If you encode it with the URL encoding format, so with the X value for specific characters, you are safe you know, from this uh, kind of attacks, okay? But it is quite peculiar. Uh, I mean, just to show you that there are many ways to deal with these uh, security aspects, but knowing all of them is difficult. So just rely on good guidelines. And if you are unsure, it's better to forbid things than to allow things. So when you allow things, just 
make sure that uh, uh, there are things which are uh, deemed safe by the community. Okay? Um, so, this is just uh, advices, uh, final advices and summary. So, in general, first, always validate input, which is something which, which already talked about. Okay? Uh, this is especially true, actually this is true for uh, the server side, for the APIs. That's why we insist a lot on saying, if you expect a number, you shouldn't allow a string, a normal string, alphanumeric string to pass. Because that's a number. Why should, mm, I mean, if it's a string, that could be a problem because maybe some attacker uh, has found that uh, you know a string in that place will create a problem that will lead to something else, etc. Okay, so in general, reject anything suspicious, strange characters, unexpected characters. There's plenty of characters which are strange. I'm not thinking about other languages alphabet. Okay, the Chinese characters are fine. Uh, the, the Arabic uh, characters are fine, but if you look at, uh, there are 100,000, more or less, Unicode characters, there are very strange stuff. There are invisible characters, uh, there are a lot of things, <laughs> okay? So, just stick to, you know, uh, what is expected, okay, uh, from your application. Uh, so, if you're not expecting code, of course, you're not allowing, uh, uh, don't allow them, don't allow it, uh, and uh, do it as soon as possible. As I was saying before, uh, if you have a stored cross scripting attack, if the stuff goes into the database, it will be served to every user asking for that content. So you should prevent the stuff from going into the database, which means validating the content before using it and storing it on the server side, okay? So this is just a couple of examples, but just to give you the idea. You know, uh, the name of a person, at least until today, does not contain HTML tag. So if you're expecting a name, first name, last name, et cetera, there's no reason why you should expect less than, greater than, and stuff like that. But be careful because, you know, depending on the specification, for instance, uh, you know, spaces are allowed, uh, accent, uh, apostrophes, etc. You know, depending on the language, uh, people can have different names, de depending on the countries, etc. So, but I mean, until now, I think, <laughs> you know, less than and greater than are not uh, part of normal names, okay? Um, oh, this is just a very simple example. I don't want to be exhaustive. I mean, I cannot be exhaustive, but, you know, just try to filter with uh, thinking about what is reasonable and what is not without being excessive, okay? Uh, for instance, uh, you know, uh, last names uh, and first names uh, in many languages can be quite short, so you cannot say there, there should be at least, I don't know, five characters, okay? This is unreasonable, okay? But, you know, there cannot be strange characters that could be reasonable. And if you are in doubt, well, you need to ask, uh, uh, the, the guys who, who, who say the, you know, you, you should develop this application. They have the specification, and they should tell you what they expect uh, to be valid or not, okay? Um, for instance, uh, a text field with some HTML in a programming forum, that, that should be okay. But uh, either we escape it before storing or we escape it before returning it to the client. I would say the, the first option is best because if you do many APIs that retrieve from the same database and the same place in the database, you should escape in, any pla in all the places. While if you escape before storing, you are safe because what is in the database is already safe and you can retrieve it without thinking about escaping, okay? So this is just uh, you know very general advice uh, uh, that, that makes sense, I would say. Uh, so, in general, remember that uh, any data or data source uh, that comes from outside your application, which also includes, uh, you know, uncommon ones like window location, 
must be treated as dangerous, potentially dangerous. Okay? And so you should think in terms of all the advice that I gave it to you. Uh, so validate the content or escape the content or sanitize the content before using it for any purpose. Okay? And when you return data uh, from the server to the client, data should be safe. Okay? It's your server's duty to make the data safe for the browser because the browser is trusting you when making requests to your APIs or in general uh, to, to your web server. Okay? There will be something else to add, but uh, we will do it when, when it's time. Okay? Uh, okay, just a very quick introduction to, um, to a second topic, okay? Uh, which is, uh, um, I, I know you, you would like to stop, a bit. let's spend just a few words on fetch and then we will break and resume after the break, okay? So we just say that, well, these attackers have a way to send your information to another place, to the attacker's place, to the attacker's server. How do they do? Well, actually, uh, there's an API in the browser environment that allows you to do exactly this uh, operation. So why it is there? Well, because typically it is used in a safe way. It's the basic uh, building block of single page applications. Single page applications make asynchronous requests to the server, okay? And this API is called the fetch. So in short, we have uh, the browser with the, our JavaScript code, the stuff that you basically designed in last lab, you know, to manipulate the DOM and create an interface for your application. You have a server that you already completed in previous labs, and we are missing a, a, a piece here, okay? And this piece that is, that is able to do HTTP request, so call the API server and get a response, is the so-called fetch API, okay? So this fetch API uh, is basically a function that is uh, available in the JavaScript browser environment, so it's not available in Node, okay? It's just in the browser environment. And um, it, it, in short, you give the API, uh, so yes, this, this function, okay? A URL to be loaded, okay? And an object that specifies the parameters by which it should be loaded. That is optional. But basically, you can specify the method, the HTTP method, either get, post, put, etc. And it returns a promise. That's why you should, we, we should uh, know promises very well. But you already know promises very well because you used it in the lab for the server part, right? And uh, the promise resolves to the response object that, in short, allows you to get the response from the web server, okay? And sometimes it is rejected, but only in the case of network errors, okay? So just uh, have a look at uh, an example. So let's say we would like to load something. We are in the browser environment. We just write in JavaScript, fetch a string with a URL, and you can load any URL. Okay, any URL on any website, okay? So this is very important to understand. That's a principle uh, of, of the attacks. So basically you can do a fetch to wherever, whatever place you like in the internet, okay? Then maybe you cannot, you are not able to get the answer. That's another problem. But you are, you are able to send information and that's the problem in short, okay? Uh, but that's natural because that's the way the web works. You load the page, which loads resources, okay, and compose your window, okay? So it's nothing strange to allow the browser, you know, to access any URL. And then how we use it? Well, as any other function that returns a promise. So either with dot then and a callback, that we receive as a parameter the answer from the server, 
or with a weight and potentially with try catch to handle rejected promises to get uh, the same response. Okay? What's inside the response? Well, actually, a response is a quite complex object, uh, which, in short, uh, has uh, many properties. The important properties are dot OK, that means uh, everything went fine. So we got uh, a status code in the range of 200, which is typically OK, or OK created, or OK something else. OK? So it's not like not found or internal server error, etc. OK? So we can check if everything was fine. And then there's a body that we can access to get the, the answer from the server. But we are quite lucky because, uh, uh, and then we will stop for the break. Huh? Um, because we don't need even in, we don't even need to access the body directly, the body of the HTTP response, but we can directly transform it into JSON if the server specified that the content was formatted in JSON format. Okay? So, in short, with response.json, we already get the answer from the server in the form of a JavaScript object. So, that's very easy to use if you think, uh, uh, I mean, if you have the mentality that JavaScript requires. That's an asynchronous function. It returns a promise. You need to handle the promise in some way, dot then or await. And then you get an object on which you can test if everything was fine. And if everything was fine, you can get the content already as a JavaScript object. OK? That's, that's perfect for our purposes. OK? So we will uh, come back to these slides after the break, because I, I can see you are a bit tired. Me too. <laughs> OK? But so now you have in mind that uh, you know, there's an API that can load things from the server. And we'll try to use it after the break together and understand all the options of this important function. OK, let's break 10 minutes or something like this. And see you in 10 minutes. <laughs>